The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. You've no doubt heard the saying, ah, that's what memories are made of. But what are they actually made of? Tonight, what neuroscience can tell us, including why forgetting is an essential part of remembering. Then, author and physician Gabor Maté is with us and why he says a toxic culture is hurting our collective health. It's Tuesday, November 15th, and that's next on The Agenda. In some sense, memory makes us who we are. It's our personal cumulative record of the life we've lived. But it's also unreliable, intermittent, and highly impressionable, isn't it? How can it be all those things? Neuroscience is unlocking answers all the time. So how exactly do we create memories, perceive experience, and store what happens throughout our lives? Let's ask. In London, UK, Charlotte Russell, cognitive neuropsychologist and associate professor of psychology at King's College London. In San Diego, California, Cognitive neuroscientist Rosanna Olson, a memory researcher at the Rotman Research Institute, an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and director of the Olson Lab. In Montreal, Quebec, Signe Sheldon, associate professor of psychology at McGill University, a Canada research chair in cognitive neuroscience of memory and principal investigator at the Sheldon Memory Lab. And here in our studio, Budika Balana assistant professor of psychology at York University and principal investigator at the Memory and Meaning Lab. And it's great to have you four with us here on TVO tonight. Badika, nice to have you. First time on the program. Thank you As it much. is, I think, for our three out-of-town guests as well. So delighted to have everybody aboard. Sigmi, let's start with you. What goes into making memories? Oh, that's a loaded question. I think the first um, point that we should uh, talk about is that, um, or to keep in mind, is that we do have different types of memories that are created and stored in different parts of the brain. So we have a main division between um, memories that we have with and without consciousness. So we can have these implicit memories, which are memories that we actually store below the level of conscious awareness. So this is memories for our skills, things like tying our shoes or riding our bikes. And we know that these memories really do affect our behavior and they actually are processed differently than um, these more declarative or memories that we, uh, where we actually uh, consciously experience what we're bringing to mind. So these memories, these episodic memories are often what we're talking about when we refer to memory. So these are recalling specific past events. And if you think about recalling these events, they're extremely complex. We have a lot of pieces of information that go into them. We have the sights, the sound, the smells, the events that unfolded and so forth and the time. And what's really vital uh, and important to understand about this process is that all those pieces are uh, brought into a memory and are actually stored all throughout the brain. And it's only when we actually retrieve a memory that we actually bring those pieces all together. All right, let me follow up with Rosanna on that, because you mentioned senses. And I wonder, Rosanna, whether there are certain senses that make for more powerful retention of memories than others. Mm -hmm. Great question. So often as a cognitive neuroscientists who study memory, we often study the kind of visual sense because that's the one that humans at least are the ones that are kind of most attuned to, that we pay most attention to. But as, as Dr. Sheldon just said, our memories are multimodal, our memories are rich. So we don't just have visual sensations that get recorded down, we have the sounds and we have the other contextual information that was around that memory when we experienced it, like the smells and uh, even tactile things. And so um, one of the parts of the brain that memory researchers really like to study is called the hippocampus. And you'll probably hear many of us refer to the hippocampus throughout this uh, session. And the hippocampus is one of the regions that we think is especially important for connecting those different senses. And the reason for that is because it actually gets input from different modalities, so different processing centers in the brain that process audition, Do you know vision, what? we got a picture of this. Let me, let, while, while you're going through this, Sheldon, can you can you flip ahead there to uh, top of page three? And just, because we're talking about this right now, so let's bring it up. Okay, there's the picture. Oh, perfect. You want to take us through it? Perfect. 
Yeah, of course. So I just mentioned our favorite area as memory research is, is the hippocampus. So you can see it's labeled on the right side of the screen, but it's actually a structure that's nestled deep within the temporal lobe. So you have the temporal lobes of the brain, the frontal lobes of the brain, the visual uh, sensory cortices are in the back in the occipital lobe, and then Badika Bellana's favorite region, the parietal region, which he can talk about in just a bit. And what happens is when you are experiencing an event, you have different processing centers that are processing the different aspects of that episode. So spatial information is processed by one part of the brain. In fact, the parietal lobe is very important for that. And that gets fed into the hippocampus. And then what we think the hippocampus is doing is putting together those different elements and we call it binding. So gluing together dif different portions of our memories. And then as Dr. Sheldon said, when we retrieve those memories, the hippocampus actually reactivates those regions throughout the neocortex, so throughout the rest of the brain um, pictured in the in the diagram that you just showed. Okay, but Charlotte, let me follow up with you in this regard. I, I mean, all things being equal, obviously, if you're visually impaired, it's one thing. If you're hearing impaired, it's another thing. But all things being equal, if, if you see something as opposed to hear it or smell it or taste it, are you likelier to retain a more powerful memory of that than if one of the other senses were at play? Um, I mean, I might be a bit biased because I previously was a visual scientist before doing memory. <laughs> and a lot of our brain is involved in our visual processing. And I think um, it's, hard, it's hard also to imagine if you can see um, remembering something that has no visual content because um, as we go about our daily life, we're taking things in through our eyes and also with all these other senses at one time. But when we try back and remember it, for most people, I think I'd be right in saying that most of the time we are building up a, a, quite a rich visual image in our mind at that time of remembering. And it has within it uh, the objects that we saw and experienced at that time, the relationships that they have to each other in the world when we had experienced this event. And also because we process it through our own eyes, it has our relationship to the objects in the world around us to this egocentric, egocentric representation, which um, when Dr. Olson then was talking about um, the uh, parietal cortex, parietal cortex is very important for this spatial processing from our own eyes, from our egocentric, it's called uh, point of view. And some of us, I think, think that this uh, personal perspective and remembering this accurately when we build up this visual image when recollecting is really important for associating our memories with ourselves, which is, is important for us to feel confident about our memories. Boutique, let me ask you this one. And you've heard people say this a thousand times. There's something that may happen 25 years ago that just stays with them. It's firmly implanted in that memory. And, you know, something last week, which you you would think you would remember because it's so recent, yeah. they can't remember at all. So what makes memories stick? Yeah, that's an, an excellent question. And um, I think it's related to what um, everyone has mentioned so far, and Dr. Russell in particular. The one thing that I think is really interesting and what you're pointing at is this importance of meaning. So sometimes some of our experiences are meaningful to us. They connect to other things that we know, or maybe they're important to our notion of who we are. And I think these kinds of memories are the ones that tend to stick. And why they stick might be because we combine our memories for certain experiences that happen in our lives with everything else that we know, our prior knowledge. So if we can contextualize a given piece of information and connect it to other things that have happened in our lives, that piece of information is better situated and better connected to other pieces of information in our lives, and we are consequently better able to remember it. So in my lab, what I'm really interested in looking at is what is this meaningfulness that seems to drive our memory system? And like, can we better define what that is as like psychologists to you know, unpack how the brain supports and interacts with meaningfulness in relationship to remembering specific recent events? That is a great question. Rosetta, have you got an answer for that? <laughs> Actually, um, I'll, uh, I'll ask 
Badika, how he is defining meaning and whether you can take apart meaning from just more experience. So is it just that there's more experiences related to what you're experiencing and then it has more connections to embed with? Or is there something special about the meaningfulness, you know, something with the amygdala or something with, or, you know, orbital frontal cortex? Do you think that there's something particular about meaning that's, I'd like to ask? Yeah. Sure. Um, so in terms of what I think, I think it's not only the number of connections, because mm -hmm. we have tons of experiences in our lives, you know, walking down a hallway where we might have done that in, like tons mm -hmm. and tons of times, but it doesn't really, it's not really that substantial. It's not really that important. It doesn't really actually connect to other things that are important to our lives. So um, there's, I think there are certain um, features of our experience that might be more connected to things like our self and things like um, are the aspects of our past experience that we personally consider important, whatever those mm -hmm. may be. And I think those ones might be overrepresented and more mm -hmm. able to kind of like be subsequently remembered. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's what I would say. So I wouldn't say it's all equal. Sigrid, so, does that ring true for you? Um, I, I, I definitely agree with that, that, you know, we, um, memories that are more meaningful are ones that are going to stick more. Um, my thoughts are also trying to disentangle meaning from emotion because we do know mm -hmm. the powerful effect that emotion can have on us encoding and storing memories. And those memories really become central features. This is because of uh, a region of the brain called the amygdala, um, the amygdala is um, very interconnected to some of these sensory uh, processing regions that you know we've been talking about. So when you have an emotional event, I'm going to ask our director to bring the picture up again so you can speak to it because <laughs> we got a, we got pictures for everything here. Okay, so great. Let, let's see the brain again. Okay, there's the the okay. Uh, for those listening the, on the, podcast, like, the amygdala exactly. is over there on the left. It, well, in the middle, but labeled on the left. Yeah, so it's just kind of like dipsy doodle down from the hippocampus. So when you have an emotional experience, the amygdala will actually um, send messages to some of these sensory perceptual processing regions of the brain um, to engage those processes. So you really pay attention to your environment. And subsequently, you're going to encode that experience um, more than a non-emotional event. So emotion is something that is intricately tied to meaning. And, um, you know, that's something that was just on my mind as, uh, as this conversation was unfolding uh, between Vidika and Rosanna, is uh, whether we can disentangle that uh, those effects. Well, let me see if I can complicate things a little bit more here. Charlotte, I gather there are different types of memories that stick with people, semantic and episodic. What's the difference? I think, so in the main, a lot of what we've been talking about are episodic memories, so memories for events that we have experienced, unique events throughout our life. Um, so remembering having dinner last night, remembering our holiday last year, or even just remembering, well, it's after lunch for me, but walking down to get lunch just before this. All of these are episodic memories, whereas semantic memories are memories for facts that we've learned, general knowledge, things like that, but also personally related facts, so personal semantics, so the names of our best friends when we were young or um, the knowledge of where something is in our local town. Um, so these semantic memories are not for events. They don't have the same contextual information that we've been talking about a lot associated with these event memories where we need to remember not just what happened, but where it was, when it was, tag it temporally in terms of our, of our life timeline as well. And does so the brain we... tend to remember one versus the other more easily? Um, no, I think, well, I do, it depends. So uh, we, if you're remembering an event from your life, this might be classed as your autobiographical memory. And within this, you would be able to access I'd say equivalently easily, the episodic information of the event for your lifetime and these personally semantic and otherwise general knowledge related semantic facts. I don't think one is easier or not, but it might be fair to say that episodic memory is more quick to decline as we get older. And it's also, it, there's a lot of evidence that it comes online later as well in development. So it might be the more, uh, 
temperamental or vulnerable part of memory than the semantic one, which tends to last much in a much more stable form as we get older. Rosanna, can I get you on that as well? And, I, and I, I'll, I'll just put myself forward as an example here. There are all kinds of semantic memories that are deeply engaged in this brain right now and I think are going to be there for a very long time. Episodic, yes. not so much. Is that typical? Right. Certainly. So, you know, somebody like yourself who has conversations all the time with many, many, many different people, you're learning a lot of different faces and names every day, but yet you're building up all of this vast semantic knowledge about the world. You know, you, you're, you're, every day you're studying something different, but you're building each day on the knowledge that you've gained. And so that is really going to be with you for a very, very long time. But those episodes that you only experience once, so, you know, well, hopefully you'll invite me back, but, <laughs> um, you know, this is the first time you've, you've met me and you might forget my name or my face because you only saw me that one time. And so, of course, as Dr. Russell just said, those are more ephemeral. And um, something else that many of us have also started to study is how these different types of memories decline with both age, just normal aging, and also with neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And we know that actually, you know, both Eventually, semantic memory is also affected, but first, episodic memory is very much affected by Alzheimer's disease, sort of the main type of, of dementia that most people have heard of. And again, that's because of the hippocampus and the regions talking to the hippocampus, starting to atrophy with disease, and then episodic memory starts to decline. Hmm. Well, uh, two observations. starts to decline in I... normal aging as well. Just sure. Because. I was just going to say two observations on that. Number one, I think it's going splendidly so far, so I don't see any reason why I wouldn't invite you back. I think it's, it's going well. And number two, and don't take this the wrong way, Rosanna, but it, you know, if you batted 688 in the 2013 World Series for the Red Sox, as David Ortiz did, I would remember that about you for sure. <laughs> but, you know, depends how these things work. Uh, yeah. Budika, random memory. Random. Why does that pop up, random memory? Mm -hmm. Um, so are you referring to just like when spontaneously something comes to mind? Absolutely. For no particular reason whatsoever. You might hearken back to something of, well, you're not old enough, but 50 years ago, let's say, something pops into your, you know. Sure. How does that happen? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, there are a lot of people who study involuntary autobiographical memories. That's the term that that's referred to as. I personally am not the expert of involuntary um, autobiographical memories. But one thing that I have been studying is spontaneous thought. So how and what we tend to think about when we're just thinking. And I think these um, ideas are related. Spontaneous thoughts, when we're just thinking, various things kind of come to mind. And one thing that's important is that there seems to be some kind of stream of Thoughts. So our thoughts tend to be related to recent experiences. And if something random and an involuntary um, autobiographical memory comes to mind, there might be something in your environment or some previous thought that you may have had that kind of um, either explicitly, like consciously aware, or implicitly reminded you of that experience, maybe due to some kind of overlap between some of the underlying features of that memory that spontaneously came to mind and whatever is in your environment or you're actively thinking about at that moment. And that interrelation, that relationship between our episodic memory system and our ability to you know, think spontaneously, I think is a really interesting one and um, might be also really related to the hippocampus and how it kind of holds these um, associations between different um, um, features features of a past episode. Well, let's cut to the chase here and, and really figure out why some people seem to be real aces at remembering things, uh, episodic or otherwise, and why some people just have a devil of a time doing it. Signe, start us off. Why, why do some people have the ability to remember things so clearly, so quickly, so sharply, and others are completely vague on all the same stuff? That's a, that is a good question as well. I, you know, it, it's it's so funny. There's a huge acceptance of individual differences in memory ability, but it's something that's only uh, we're only recently starting to really uh, take a deep dive in the research. Um, for people who are really good at remembering, um, let's say lists of numbers, so you know those memory champions uh, who can uh, recite pi for 978 digits or something. Um, often what you find is that these individuals are really good at using mnemonic strategies. 
So they'll use some sort of strategies to really deeply encode or really form memories that are then easier to bring to mind later on. So one that people often use to really help with memory is uh, something called the Memory Palace. People watch Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes, they probably know this, where you take something familiar like a common space and then you add, uh, add whatever uh, items of a list you're trying to learn within that visualized space. And there is, um, there is a lot of evidence to show that that really helps to bolster memory in um, both these people who are really, really good at memory, but also in individuals who are having some trouble. Now, I, with saying that, that strategy relies a lot on uh, visual processing. And recently, there's been this discovery of individuals who um, actually have a complete lack of visual imagery, and that really changes the way these individuals remember. So these are people who are called uh, uh, people with aphantasia, and they cannot form a visual representation in their mind, yet they still can remember. It just means that they're remembering differently. They're not using these visual strategies uh, when they remember. And that leads them to have a much different experience than someone who actually can use these visual uh, images to recollect the past. So there is this difference in people who are really good at memory, bad at memory. But I think we also have to appreciate the fact that even within you know, our group here today, we all are going to remember the same experience ex very differently because we use different uh, forms of uh, processing when we're... Uh, forming and retrieving our memories. You know, you've reminded me of something my father often says, which is, I've got millions of mnemonic devices, I just can't remember any of them, <laughs> which kind of defeats the, uh, anyway. Uh, okay, let's follow up on this some more. Some people have a better ability to remember things than others. Charlotte, what would you add to that answer in terms of why that is? Um, I think, so something that I was thinking when uh, Dr. Sheldon was just talking was also that, um, it's not just visual that people are using those strategies, but space as well. And, and some people think that people with aphantasia can still maintain these spatial relationships without vision, which is interesting. And so I think having uh, a very active and, and well um, titrated spatial representation of the world around us really helps us remember certain things. But also something I think uh, that Dr. Sheldon's worked on as well is that it's not just that people are uh, better or worse at memory, but there are differences in terms of what types of memory people are better at. So they can um, they could be uh, using more episodic style strategies to remember even semantic information, you know, placing it a bit like the memory palace, but in a more everyday way. So using information that links to themselves to remember the things they want to remember semantically because they're, that episodic system feels stronger for them. Um, whereas people who have a stronger semantic memory might rely more on semantic memory strategies to try and remember think, events that happen to them, but with the very semantic related information rather than the event based information. Budika, well before you were born, I remember <laughs> I remember watching uh, the Johnny Carson show, Sorry. and he had a guest on mm -hmm. who had met every single member of the studio audience, so okay. that was about 150 people, before the show started. Yeah. He met them all mm -hmm. for a second apiece, yeah. Yeah. heard their names, and then an hour later, when the show was on, he literally went through every single person in the audience, got every single name right. How do you do that? I certainly could not do that. But um, <laughs> in terms of how you would do that, I think it relates to all these strategies that everyone's been bringing up. So um, you have to take the information that you're presented with the name, which otherwise is kind of like floating around without any connections to anything, and you have to come up with some kind of way to make that more memorable by connecting it to maybe some um, place, if you were going to use this kind of like memory palace strategy, or connecting it to often um, some kind of weird fact or some mm. strange acronym. What you have to do is somehow take other things that you know that might be memorable and associate this piece of information, which otherwise might not be, to something memorable, which can give you a bit of an anchor. Mm. And these kinds of mnemonic strategies are ones that um, uh, these memory champions tend to use, which I imagine this person used also. So right. it's a skill. It's something that you can work on. Rosanna, is it a fact that everything we have experienced in life 
is in our brain somewhere. We may not be able to access it when we want, right. but is it all in there? <laughs> some people would probably say yes. So some people would probably say that at least when your brain gets to a certain maturity level, it should be able to retain a certain amount of information. And we've, we've seen that certain, um, for certain types of memory, for example, pictures of scenes, people, you can test people on thousands and thousands of visual scenes and they will remember them. It's, it's really quite remarkable. Um, and some people would say that when you forget things, it's not that you've necessarily forgotten that piece of information, but that it's in there, but you're just not cueing that information appropriately. And so when you are experiencing memory difficulties, sometimes, as you know, we all know, you'll think to yourself, I can't remember that person's name. I can't remember that person's name. But then five minutes later, when you go to the grocery store, the name pops into your head. And so that's why some people say that much of the information that sometimes we might think is forgotten is actually in our brains. However, it might have sort of kind of diminished, like faded into the background so far that we can't access it anymore unless you have the very specific cue or something comes along that strengthens it and, and then you're able to retrieve that memory. Right. And Sydney, certainly as certainly as you age, uh, the connections become weaker and weaker and and hmm. harder to access. Those. Uh, t t tell me about it. Tell me about it. I'm, I'm experiencing that every day. Signe, on the other hand, something like let's look at the other side of the coin, PTSD. For people, let's say frontline responders who have experienced PTSD, that 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 somehow contributes to them forgetting particulars of certain circumstances. What's going on in the brain that makes that happen? What I, I mean with PTSD, what often happens with that is people get very uh, very stuck on uh, a single event. So you have this event that was very traumatic. Um, and that event almost prioritizes the memory processing system uh, in lieu of other information that people might want to take in. And what you find in PTSD is if you have this traumatic event, like um, you know a war, a wartime, a wartime experience, you're going to replay that in your mind over and over and over again in the same form that it's in. And so that memory becomes almost static, almost frozen in your memory. And it then is activated very strongly to a lot of different uh, cues in your environment. So following up what Rosanna was saying about, you know, there's cues and things in our environment that trigger our memories to come to our mind. And unfortunately with PTSD, what you see is that that trauma event really just encompasses um, so much of that person's sort of memory uh, space that it's very easily accessed and it's very tough to uh, sort of change that memory. And that's actually what you want to do in a lot of therapeutic interventions is trying to get get to these memories that we need to change and get people to reappraise them in new ways so they don't create as much dysfunction as they do. And Charlotte, we hear this expression before, photographic memories. Is that a real thing? Um, I, I think a lot of work shown that sometimes we can very confidently believe we have a photographic memory of something but if we're able to be objectively tested on exactly what happened we might have remembered the gist and the emotional content of these uh flashbulb or photographic memories we have um but not the actual details and sometimes the actual details the fine details are, are, are not as good as for a less emotional less high-powered photographic memory but the perception that we have of remembering something in a photographic way is certainly real that's what we believe but how accurate that is might might sometimes be a question it might always it might not always be perfectly accurate gotcha we're down to our last minute here signe let me put this to you and that is do you think there's actually we're talking about memory here do you think there's a benefit to forgetting Absolutely. So, you know, we can talk about forgetting as, um, you know, problematic for aging and forms of dementia, but there's this other uh, way to see forgetting that, uh, you know, the field is really, um, really focusing on right now um, as something that's really adaptive. So in our experiences, we have so much information that we really do have to prioritize what we want to remember 
from that experience and discard useless details from an event that aren't really going to tell us anything. So we need to actually forget some aspects of our memory so that we can apply whatever lesson we learn from a current experience to future events. So just like a quick, uh, quick toy example, if um, let's say you were uh, like out in the street and you like, you ran into like a bear and this bear like tried to attack you um, and you're like, oh no, bears are dangerous when I see them. That's the information you have to take away from that event. If you start to focus on, you know, the trees, the like the, your jogging, the sweatsuit color, the time of day and so forth and say, bears are only dangerous when I'm wearing this suit at this time of day, then you're not going to really take what's important from that memory and go forward. So being able to forget those little details and focus on the gist lesson from a memory is an essential component of memory, and it's essential for memory to be adaptive so we can actually survive and uh, not get attacked by bears. Otherwise, otherwise you become what we call, I believe the technical term is, lunch. Okay. <laughs> This was memorable. I want to thank all four of you for coming on our program tonight. Budika Balana, Sydney Sheldon, Rosanna Olson, Charlotte Russell. Great to have the four of you on TVO tonight for such a memorable discussion. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Especially after the last few years, people are understandably focused on their health and wellness. But according to Dr. Gabor Maté, our collective health seems to be deteriorating. From chronic illnesses to addiction and mental health, all is not well. His new book aims to untangle what he sees as a problem much larger than our personal health struggles and mark a better path forward. Written with his son Daniel, the book is called The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness and Healing in a Toxic Culture. And Dr. Gabor Maté joins us now from Victoria, British Columbia for more. It's great to have you back on our program. How are you doing these days? I'm very well. A bit of, um, fatigued in my voice from all the speaking I've been doing on this interminable book tour, but otherwise I'm doing great. Thank you. It's nice to be with you again. Well, that's a good sign. If, if you've got a sore throat because so many people are interested in this book, that's a good sign. Uh, let's start with this, Dr. Mate, and that is you, you open the book with quite a conundrum. We live in a culture that is obsessed with health, and yet you say our collective health is deteriorating. What prompts you to come to that conclusion? Statistics. The number of people with anxiety is rising, the number of children being diagnosed with all manner of mental health conditions and being medicated for it is rising in this country and throughout the globalized Western world. Um, the number of people with autoimmune disease is rising. Canada leads the world, I think, in Crohn's disease amongst young people. Um, the, the number of people dying of drug overdoses is rising during COVID. The uh, number of people being addicted went up. So but by all manner, the, the number of people on medications for all kinds of health conditions is going up. So by all manner of statistics and as my observation as a trained physician our collective health is getting worse can you make sense of that paradox though if we are obsessed with our personal health how is it our collective health is getting so bad part of the uh, limitations of the western medical view for all its amazing achievements and technological marvels and surgical miracles is nevertheless that we see health as an individual issue uh, relegated to particular organs or, or an isolated person. But actually, from the scientific point of view, health is not a matter of individual um, concern, but has to do with our in per interpersonal relationships with other people and the entire culture that we live in. So looking at health from, a, say, it's something like the loneliness epidemic. Now, loneliness is rising in the Western world statistically. And loneliness, extreme loneliness, is as much of a risk factor for chronic illness and early death as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Hmm. But loneliness is not an individual phenomenon. It's a social phenomenon that's been rising in the Western world for the last 40 years. Same with something like obesity. The rates of obesity in the Western world are going up. But those are not individual decisions that have to do with stress and the kind of food that people are sold and the kind of um, 
ways that people use eating as a way of dealing with their emotional problems. These are all social issues. The fact that women have eight, 70 or 80% of autoimmune disease is not a biological gender issue. It has to do with the stress on women. The fact that in Canada, an indigenous woman has six times the rate of rheumatoid arthritis than that of anybody else. This is in a population that never used to have rheumatoid arthritis. It's not an individual problem. It's a social problem, one of uh, long-term trauma and colonialism and present-day deprivation. So these are all social questions. They're not individual questions. Well, let me pick up on that indigeneity angle there. Does it go without saying that race and gender and so on uh, have a significant, uh, have a, an additional significance in all of what you're talking about? Yes. The more stressed people are, either in their personal lives or as a result of social conditions or both, the more at risk they are for illness. So if women are more at risk for chronic illness than men are, and the indigenous people are even more at risk. Now, when you get the intersectionality of, of, of gender and, and race, then you have increased risk. And so both in the United States and in Canada, people of color, uh, and particularly women are at much higher risk for chronic illness. And again, indigenous or women of color are at significantly higher risk statistically. And this has been known for decades. These are not individual problems, they're social problems. A an American black woman, for example, the more experience of racism she has to endure, the higher the risk for asthma. So is that asthma, is the inflammation of her airways an individual problem in an isolated organ, or is it a social malaise? Well, clearly, it's a combination of both. Hmm. Does it seem to you that the institutions in our country that are responsible for improving this situation care enough to do anything about it? I'm not going to accuse anybody of not caring, but I will say that whether they care or not, they're utterly ignorant of the uh, basic issues. For example, in this book, I show or gather the evidence linking trauma, for example, and adult illness, both of mind and body, whether we're talking about chronic physical illness, for example, um, a Canadian study showed that men who were sexually abused in childhood have tripled the risk of heart attacks as adults. And the same statistics can be shown about trauma and addiction, trauma and mental health. A British psychologist, a member of the British Academy, Dr. Richard Bentall, said that the link between childhood trauma and adult mental health illness is as strongly proven scientifically as the link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. But Steve, the average medical student in Canada, shocking to say, doesn't receive a single lecture on trauma and its connection to adult illness. Unbelievable. Given the tens of thousands of research papers, I cite some of them in the book, linking trauma and all manner of conditions of body and mind, the average medical student doesn't get a single lecture about it. Why not? It's, it's, it's almost unfathomable. Why not? Because the Western medicine, again, for all its incredible achievements, and I'm certainly as trained in Western medicine, I can only marvel at the amazing accomplishments of, of my profession. But at the same time, it makes the mistake of separating mind from the body. So it doesn't understand that people's emotional lives and therefore their social lives are actually connected to their physiology. This is despite the fact that great physicians throughout history have recognized these links. Canada's own Sir William Osler said in 1890 that rheumatoid arthritis is a stress-driven disease. Since he's made that comment, there's been so much research proving the accuracy of his observation. The average rheumatologist doesn't know a thing about that research because we separate the mind from the body. So when you go to a, a neurologist or a rheumatologist or any kind of a specialist, they'll never ask you about trauma, stress, your personal relationships, even though physiologically, these are all connected to what's happening to the biology of your body. Well, you do make a distinction between, let's call it uppercase T trauma and lowercase T trauma. Yeah. What's the difference? Well, it's only to distinguish the events that cause the trauma. And the trauma itself means a wound. So people can be wounded in a number of ways. It, trauma is a psychic wound that leaves an impact on the, in the body, in the nervous system, in the brain. And those imprints show up in the form of dysfunctions, 
anxieties, depressions, physical illness, and so on later on in life as voluminous research has beyond the shadow of a doubt demonstrated. In terms of what causes trauma, it can be two types. It can be the big T, which is the easily identifiable, terrible things that do happen to children, such as physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. Look at the indigenous uh, population and its experience in the residential schools, for example, and the outcomes of that in mental health and suicide and addictions and physical illness. So those are the big T ones, you know, or a war, a tsunami, the death of a parent, violence in the family, a parent dying, a parent being jailed. These are what we call the big D traumas. But kids can also be wounded, not because terrible things happen to them, but because the right things that should happen don't happen. In other words, if children's needs are not met, and children have certain definable evolutionary dictated emotional needs for health development, if those needs are not met, as they're often they're not in the society, children can be wounded. And those developmental events is what I call small T trauma. For example, you can hit a child and beat them and the effects are predictable. You can spank them as some psychologists, some very well-known psychologists in Canada still advocate, despite all the evidence that spanking is as harmful as a more severe form of physical abuse. Or you can just not pick a small child up when they're crying, when they're crying and they need your attention. They need the physical contact. Now you tell a mother gorilla not to pick up their baby when they're crying, but we tell human mothers all the time not to pick up their babies. That traumatizes the child. That wounds the child. But that the, wound will show up later on in life. But the way you have described it suggests to me anyway that that we are, it is impossible to live a trauma-free life. If you look at, I mean, clearly not everybody's going to experience capital T trauma, but, yeah. but probably everybody is going to at least experience a lowercase t trauma. And if that's the case, are we a society of damaged goods 24-7? I don't call anybody damaged because I see the possibility of healing. Thank God that I've experienced it myself and I've witnessed it and have helped others achieve it. Um, so I don't use the word damaged, but you're quite right. There are very few people in this society because of the way we raise children, because of the stress on parents, because of the multi-generational trauma. Look, even a simple thing like the current economic crisis with inflation, as is going up in Canada right now, a Canadian study showed that women who's <clears throat> under economic stress, their children have abnormal stress hormone levels excuse me, which means that the parents' financial stresses translate into physiological impact on the child's body. So in this society, there are very few, few of us who escape without some degree of trauma. Of course, there's degrees of it, there's, you know, variations of it, but most of us are wounded and, and we don't recognize it sufficiently. Well, let's, if I can, pluck an example of the last two and a half years during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. And I wonder if, can I say this with any degree of certainty, that those who succumbed to this disease or experienced deteriorating mental health circumstances as a result of everything that is associated with COVID, did those who experienced the worst of COVID experience the worst of it in your judgment, because at some point earlier in their life, they have had unresolved trauma. You know, there's a lot to that. First of all, again, let's look at who was most at risk for COVID. It was people of color, of minorities, you know, and people stressed and living under poor economic conditions. So there was, there was you know, we, we kept saying that we're all in this together, but we weren't in all together. You know, there was a social gradient as to who got COVID or who was most threatened by it. Now, <clears throat> some families under the impact of COVID, where they had to socially isolate, spend time together, they actually got stronger. Parents actually got closer to their kids. But families where there was stress already, particularly childhood trauma, those families, the stress of COVID would have exasperated the unresolved traumas. And so, for example, the number of children being abused went up during COVID, family violence went up, uh, pe people using uh, uh, drugs went up. So that it depends when, when a stressor like COVID happens, those that are well-resourced, they'll do reasonably well, but those already stressed by previous trauma, 
you expect them to do worse and to have long-term consequences, for sure. Well, I think the group that was most disproportionately affected by, by COVID was the over, those over 80 years old. Uh, they certainly disproportionately died more than anybody else. Is that to say that, that their lifetimes of trauma, which would have been presumably more than younger people, uh, helped contribute to the fact that they died in bigger numbers? I don't think I would jump to that conclusion. I mean, age brings itself, age itself brings a diminishing of your immune responses, you know, or reduced capacity of the body to fight off infection and to stay resilient. So I think age itself is simply a risk factor in and of itself. I don't know that I would bring trauma into that particular mix. Okay, understood. You are, uh, I have to say, in all the interviews I've seen with you, uh, you're quite open about your own uh, personal challenges and your own travails over the course of your life. Uh, I don't want to pry too much, but if you'd care to share some things that might give some inspiration to others, given that you seem to be managing these travails relatively well, maybe that maybe this is the time to do that. You know, you're not, you're not prying. I mean, I'm very open about this stuff. The fact is that uh, as a Jewish infant uh, born just before the Nazis occupied Hungary, I was a very traumatized infant. Uh, my mother, having lost her parents in Auschwitz, her father, my father being away in forced labor, the conditions we lived under were simply atrocious and life-threatening. And at some point, she gave me to a stranger in a street in Budapest where I stood just a week ago on the very spot to to send me to safety so I didn't see her for five or six weeks. And that left, all that year, left me with a tremendous sense of stress, anxiety, a sense that I wasn't lovable, a sense that I wasn't wanted because why else would my mother give me to a stranger when I'm 11 months old? And those stresses showed up later on in my life in my workaholism where I, as a physician, I had to keep proving how important I was by working so hard, which meant I wasn't available to my own children as a emotionally available, present, um, grounded adult, which means I passed on my traumas onto my children. And so I'm very open about that because people, this is how it works. And we pass on our traumas, not because we mean to, but simply because we can't help it until we work them out. At what point in your life did you realize that's what was going on in your life? You were there, therefore able to logically analyze it and do something about it. Yeah, well, I was in my 40s. I was um, a successful physician, quite respected, um, writing for various newspapers like the Vancouver Sun and the Global Mail quite regularly. Everything was going well, but I was depressed. My marriage was very conflictual, and my children were afraid of me. And at some point, I had to ask, despite the fact that I loved them so much, you know, and at some point, I have to ask myself, well, what's going on here? And I wish you could say it was a matter of simple logical analysis. I think uh, healing is a bit more complex than that. We can understand things intellectually, but not have them work through emotionally. That's certainly the case for me. But it was the unhappiness of myself, despite my success, and the unhappiness of my family that impelled me to start examining what's going on with me. Well, let's continue that examination and get a quote from your book, shall we? This is from The Myth of Normal. Sheldon, top of page two, let's bring this graphic up. No person is their disease, and no one did it to themselves, not in any conscious, deliberate, or culpable sense. Disease is an outcome of generations of suffering, of social conditions, of cultural conditioning, of childhood trauma, of physiology bearing the brunt of people's stress and emotional histories, all interacting with the physical and psychological environment. It is often a manifestation of ingrained personality traits, yes, but that personality is not who we are any more than are the illnesses to which it may predispose us. I mean, that does raise a bunch of questions, so let's dive into this. What role do you think individuals play in their own illnesses? They play an unconscious role, so nobody deliberately brings on illness for themselves. But um, let's say that you grew up in a home where when you're angry as a child, you were punished, as happens in a lot of families. As a matter of fact, psychologists, some will advise parents that an angry child should be made to sit by themselves so they come back to normal, quote unquote, from a very famous book by a Canadian psychologist. 
Well, if the child gets the message <clears throat> that their anger, which is a totally natural emotion, by the way, built into our brains, but if the child gets the message that the anger is not acceptable, there's no room for it, then in order to be acceptable to the parents and not to be rejected by them, the child will unconsciously push their anger below the surface. They'll repress the anger. The child doesn't do this deliberately or with any conscious sense, but they'll do it as a matter of making connection with the parents. Now, the repression of anger, on the other hand, because of the mind-body unity that, again, has been demonstrated by science, although, again, unappreciated by the medical profession, when you repress your healthy anger, you're also repressing your immune system. Because the immune system and healthy anger both save the same function of protecting your boundaries. When you pushed on the one, you pushed on the other. That makes you more predisposed, as many studies have shown, to autoimmune disease later on or to malignancy. Now, you didn't do it deliberately or consciously with any awareness. Repressing your anger was your way of surviving your childhood environment, but that repression then becomes part of your personality and it, in the long term, it undermines your immunity. So the, the, the benefit of realizing this is not simply, to, it's not a question of blaming yourself for having brought on your illness. I mean, nobody's to be blamed for childhood patterns unconsciously adapted. But if you recognize it, and if you work on it, you can become much healthier as an adult. And I've seen that over and over and over again. I've seen people do very well with autoimmune diseases once they get rid of these childhood patterns that were ingrained in them as a matter of survival. So we're not just talking about theory here. We're talking about healing and, and possibility. Do you believe the increasing political toxicity, both in real life and on social media, contributes to this? There's an American psychologist who came up with a line called a new disease called headline deficit disorder or headline stress disorder. <laughs> I think the increasing toxicity, vituperation, hostility of political life adds to people's stresses. It makes people more defensive, more scared, more suspicious of others. And I think it contributes to ill health. Let's pull up another quote of the book here and spend our remaining moments talking about healing, because that sounds like a really good thing to do. It all starts, mm. you write, with waking up. Waking up to what is real and authentic in and around us and what isn't. Waking up to who we are and who we're not. Waking up to what our bodies are expressing and what our minds are suppressing. Waking up to our wounds and our gifts. Waking up to what we have believed and what we actually value. Waking up to what we will no longer tolerate and what we can now accept. Waking up to the myths that bind us and the interconnections that define us. Waking up to the past as it has been, the present as it is, and the future as it may yet be. Waking up most especially to the gap between what our essence calls for and what normal has demanded of us. And my question is, does everybody have the wherewithal to do this? Everybody has the potential to do it. Uh, the healing is a capacity that nature gives to all creatures. <clears throat> the question is, will they have the impetus to do it? And once they have the impetus, will they have the support to do it? So I think my experience uh, as a physician, as an individual, as somebody who's uh, done a lot of healing work in this world, um, is that the potential is inside everybody as long as there's consciousness. But it does demand waking up to those and seeing the way things are. It, it means losing our illusions of our own lives, about our society. It does mean waking up to the fact that what, considered is, what is considered normal in the society is neither natural or healthy in many, many ways. And we need to do better or we need to do differently. Normal so overrated, isn't it? Normal is highly overrated. Well, you know, in the medical sense, it's, it's good. Like there's a normal temperature range outside which you can't live. So in that sense, normal is what's healthy and natural or a certain level of blood acidity. If it's too high or too low, you can't live. In that sense, normal is what's healthy and natural. But we make the assumption that what we get used to in this society will be considered a norm is also healthy and natural. In many ways, it is not. Right. Now, you've traveled all over the world. Is there one country in particular you think has got this figured out better than others? I wish I could tell you. Uh, well, there's some countries where there's more of an ease. I mean, I was in Portugal recently, and, you know, people there are really friendly. And there's a kind of an ease about them. There's a kind of a smile. There's a kind of an acceptance, you know. 
they also have the most sensible drug laws, by the way, of any country in the Western world. I'm not saying they've got it all figured out, but they're still more connected. There's more of a sense of communality, of belonging, and of just, you know, ease in this world. Um, I'm not holding up Portuguese society as some kind of ideal. I don't know if about it, but I certainly noticed the atmospheric difference um, uh, in a country. So some people do do it better than others, but overall, in this globalized world, we're all suffering from the same malaise. Hmm. If there then, just in conclusion, if there were one thing people who either read your book or hear about your book through this interview, if they could take away from it and change their lives in that way to make themselves healthier, what would you recommend? Yeah. It's that we're, there's a true self that belongs to all of us and betraying or, or getting disconnected from that self is one of the impacts of trauma and it's one of the impacts of this society that in so many ways is so artificial. So getting back to our true selves is both possible and necessary. Didn't Shakespeare say, to thine own self be true 400 years ago? This is not new advice. Shakespeare put the words in the hands of a total hypocrite, in the mouth of a total hypocrite, <laughs> Polonius, in, in the play Hamlet. Nevertheless, the words are absolutely true and it's the best advice anybody can give you. Well, it's also true that it has been a joy having you on this program. We know you've been on before. We appreciate you being on again. We'll remind people the name of your book is The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. And we're glad that it's brought Dr. Gabor Mate to our program from Victoria, British Columbia. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. That is the agenda for Tuesday, November 15th, 2022. Tomorrow, a new parliamentary report is asking some tough questions about whether Global Affairs Canada has a decent handle on security and intelligence, particularly in its overseas dealings, and we'll shine a light on that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.